Hello and welcome back. My name is Nathan House and I am with the Church of Christ in Houston, California. Today we're going to be looking at Psalm 37. Again, we're going through the book of Psalms. We're not necessarily looking at every single Psalm or even every single verse. As we'll see today, we're not going to go through this entire chapter verse by verse. Again, my name is Nathan House and if you can like or subscribe to this video, that would be appreciated. So as we begin to kind of look at the uh, Psalm chapter 37, I'm going to uh, show you guys just real quickly. This is a diagram organized by the structure of the psalm. And how, how did the psalmist organize this, this particular psalm? And so this psalm is called an acrostic. And so this is, again, this is called Psalms Explorer, this little program that I'm using here. Uh, this is an acrostic poem. An acrostic means with every, uh, with every B section, there's a, there's a, corresponding Hebrew letter of the alphabet. He'll go like, you know, like if it's in English, A to Z. So the first part would be with the letter A and then B and so forth. And so this is an acrostic psalm. There are several acrostic psalms in scripture. The largest psalm, in the lar largest chapter in all the Bible, Psalm 119, which many of us are familiar with Psalm 119. This is an acrostic as well. And so here we're going to look at Psalm 37, and the psalmist, when he organizes this, which was, which was authored by David, the first two verses, as it is laid out in our Bible, will begin with the Hebrew letter Aleph, and then the next two verses will begin with the Hebrew letter Bet, and so forth. So he's going down the Hebrew alphabet, and so there's this structure that we see. There's also another structure that is also in the, in the chapter as well. It's also called a chiasm. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, but I want to point out something else regarding this, this psalm, Psalm 37. So it's an acrostic, but it is also considered a psalm of wisdom. It's considered a psalm of wisdom. And, you know, th who decided that this was a psalm of wisdom? Well, every person really can decide for themselves. You know, but in this particular uh, idea, a particular opinion, it is a psalm of wisdom. When I read this psalm, I absolutely see some of that aspect, but I also see something else. I see that it is a psalm of trust, a psalm that is calling uh, God's people, God, the righteous, to have trust in God. And so it is, a, it is a wisdom psalm, but it is a psalm that calls us to be people that trust in God as well. Another thing that we'll note when we go through this chapter is that there is quite a few imperative verbs. An imperative verb is a verb of command. Usually it's considered a verb of command. Um, and so it, it's, it's going to be telling somebody to do something. It's a petition, right? And so we're going to kind of point out some of these imperative verbs as we go along. We're not going to necessarily look at all of them, but we will note some of them as well. So as we begin here in a moment, just a moment, actually looking at the text, the first eight verses, there are a lot of imperatives, 11 in the first eight verses. And then you'll see that the numbers, uh, the, the imperatives are kind of grouped in a few verses here and there. You'll see three in verse 27. And, but most of the imperatives begin right at the beginning of this chapter. So as we go through, I'll kind of highlight, kind of point out some of these imperative verbs. But also notice this as we go through. I want you to watch. I want you to look through as you're studying this. And again, study this chapter more on your own. You know, I'm glad you're studying it with me right now. But go through this chapter in its entirety. We're not going to do it in its entirety. But go through this chapter in its entirety. But watch for God's actions in this chapter. What is God doing? Who is he acting for? Who is he acting against? And so that's what I even asked here, right? Who is he working for? Where do we see God's actions directed? What are his actions? Uh, are there any actions that are directed against people? So again, be watching these things. So we're going to, again, highlight some of the imperatives. We'll point out some of God's actions. But as you go through and you finish the chapter on your own, because again, we're not going to do it in its entirety, just watch for some of those things as well. So let's go ahead and we're going to look at this, Psalm 37. Uh, why should the readers, as we get into this, why should the readers find comfort? Why should the readers find comfort? I'm going to be hopping back and forth from the text to this screen as well. So let's go ahead and look at the first few verses here. Let's read verses 1 and 2. He says, Fret not yourselves because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. The word fret occurs several times, actually I think three times in this psalm. And the word can be translated, don't be angry. Uh, we're, fret kind of gives an idea of concern or worry. Uh, but you know, it's like, how many of us sometimes look at the world around us? We look at the wickedness 
you know, one of the things that has really been discouraging to me, and I have a hard time, you know, trying to remind myself this world's not my home. I, I, I get involved in these things and I, and I'm discouraged and I fret when I see how, you know, large groups of people are, are rushing in Nordstrom's and robbing it. Or there, or a group of people are, are rushing into a target and robbing it, and it bothers me, you know. And I want justice, and I want the wicked to be held accountable, and I want those who are innocent bystanders to be protected and safe. And there's times because of the evil and the wrong in this world that I fret, I get angry, I get worried, I get concerned. And so David begins this chapter, and he says, "Don't fret." And again, look at how he describes these people. So here again, this word fret, it's an imper. sorry, uh, it's not an imperative just yet. We'll see some imperatives though. He said, but don't fret yourself because of evildoers. Do not fret because of evildoers. Do not be envious of wrongdoers. Don't be angry. Don't be worried. Don't concern. Why should I not be worried about these things? Here is the reason. Here is one of the reasons presented. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Why should we not be worried about them? You know, here's here is the real reason because one way or another they will face justice. They will face it. I I don't want and I and I know you're I know you agree with me. I don't want anybody's destruction. I don't want anybody's lives ruined. But at the same time, those who are doing wicked and harming e- and others and being evil I either want them to change or to be held accountable. And so he says, guys, at some point, these wicked ones, these evildoers, they're going to be like the grass. You know, grass grass is temporary. They're going to be like the green herb. They are not going to last. They will face justice. They will face judgment either here on earth or, or eventually even with God. But don't fret yourself. So then here begins this list of imperatives, right? Here's this imperative. What should you do? Instead of fretting yourself, instead of being angry, what should I do? You know, some of these things are out of my control, right? What am I supposed to do if 200 miles away, a group of 30 people rush into a Nordstrom's and and rob it? What can I do? There's not a lot I can do. But one thing I can do, and this is an imperative verb, right? A a verb petitioning us, commanding us uh, to do something. Trust in the Lord. This is the imperative. Do. Here's it. Do good. Here is the command. Trust in the Lord and do good. If I trust in the Lord and he's telling me these people are going to fade, I have to trust that God will deal with them. Here's another imperative verb. Delight yourself in the Lord. See, I can either be fretting about these things or I can be delighting myself in the Lord. What else does he say? And he will give you desires of your heart. Here's another command. Commit your way to the Lord. And this word commit is kind of an interesting word. The the word was used, so remember in uh, the book of Genesis when Jacob uh, rolls the stone away from from a well, right? That word, uh, it's a Hebrew word and it means to roll something. And it's kind of weird. Well, how does that get into this idea of committing? We'll talk about it in a moment. But notice what he says. Notice this imperative verb. Commit your way to the Lord. So don't be fretting about the evildoers. Trust in the Lord. What else should I do? Commit your way to the Lord. And again, we see this again, same word, right? Trust in him. Why? Why should I not be fretting about these wicked? Because God will act. Because God will do something. And again, I said, watch for God's actions. Now, there's nothing specifically laid out concerning God's actions, but there is definitely a reminder on the part of David to his readers that God will act. Do we sometimes need to be reminded that our God will act on behalf of the righteous? Do we sometimes need to be reminded that we have a God who who, who is not unaware of what is happening? He says he will act. How is he going to act? He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Let's hop back to this other screen real quick. Why should the readers find comfort? Because the wicked will come to an end. The wicked will come to an end. Now notice verses 3 and 5 as we go back to these. And then I ask the question, are these promises conditional? Let's go back and look at verse 3 and 5 again. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will act. 
these things are these things are conditioned upon these, these promises are conditioned upon what us us doing what we're supposed to do what is the condition we need to trust in the lord what is the condition we need to delight ourselves in the lord what is the condition we need to commit our way to the lord and as a result he will look at this let's look at this promise he will bring forth your righteousness as the light so again we notice uh, God's actions on behalf of the righteous. He will act. Let's look back here for a second at this word commit. I already kind of alluded to it, uh, but this word, uh, this is from the theological word study of the Old Testament, T-W-O-T. The thought, commit, the Hebrew word uh, represented by the English letters G-L-L, right? The thought is to roll one's trouble. So I talked about how it's, it's this idea of rolling something, right? What am I rolling in this case? To roll one's trouble Look at this, upon someone or away from oneself. I'm going to roll my trouble away from the, my from my anger, my fretting about the weak. I'm, I'm concerned about the wicked, the evildoers. I'm going to roll my trouble away from them, and I'm going to bring it to God. I'm going to roll my trouble to God. I'm going to trust in him. I'm going to commit myself to him. David is calling us to give our problems, our trust to God. He is calling us to commit to God. We have a God who we can bring our troubles to we have a god who we can you know take those burdens and give them to him to roll them towards him i'm going to pick up again in this text look at verse 7 here let's go back to the text be still so here again uh this other imperative verb be still before the lord and wait patiently for him let's just talk about that for a second isn't that a very difficult thing to be still, to wait for him. You know, so many times in our life, we're going through hardships, we're going through struggles, we have prayer requests, we have challenges, and we want God to deal with them in our time frame. We want God to work in such a way that that we see this happening. And again, it's all about our time frame. It is hard to wait patiently for God to do his actions. He will act. But we have to be patient as we wait for his actions. Be still before the Lord. You know, one of the great Psalms uh, calls us to be still and know, right? Be still and know that I am God. There's a time that we need to stop and just and just trust in God. And we need to say, you know, it's out of my hand. It's out of my control. But God, I'm rolling my troubles to you. I'm committing to you. And I'm waiting patiently for you. Then he continues in verse 7. Fret not. So again, there's that word, right? That we saw earlier back here in verse one. And I've highlighted it here. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger. And again, I even mentioned that the word fret can mean to, to get angry, right? Refrain from anger. Forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. Why not? Why should I not do all these things? Because in the end, it doesn't do any good. It doesn't do me any good. It, it, I get riled up. You know, I'm, again, seriously, when I think about it in my own life and I watch it on the news and, and I read about these things and my, and my heart breaks for people whose uh, businesses are being destroyed by, by criminals, whose homes are getting broken into or, or hurt. or in, and, and I get I can get angry. I can get. But in the end, it doesn't really do me a lot of good. It tends to evil. It, it doesn't bring me a lot of benefit. What I need to do is I need to trust in the Lord. I need to light myself in the Lord. I need, I need to commit to Him. It doesn't mean I, I should go around with blinders on and not recognizing and seeing the problems. This chapter highlights that there's going to be problems. Several times this chapter highlights there's going to be difficult times. But in the end, what do I do in these difficult times? I trust in God. I wait patiently for Him. I remind myself that God will deal with the wickedness, the evil ones, they will soon fade like the grass, verse 2. Let's look back here. So again, uh, we're not going to go through this whole chapter, but a couple of other things. This chapter focuses on the wicked and the righteous. This is not an uncommon thing um, in, in the book of Psalms or the book of Proverbs, right? Contrasting wicked and righteousness. And So real quickly, here's kind of the character in the end of the wicked, uh, or just a couple of things to note. See the word wicked 14 times, evil five times, wrongdoer. Again, this is based off the English standard version. Uh, wrongdoers, I think, occurs once. I didn't write it down. Enemies of the Lord, 
But all of these phrases are used to describe these people in Psalm 37. And as you look at some of this text, look at verse 22 real quick. Look at verse 22. For those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land. So if you look at the contrast, right? The, the, the righteous versus the wicked. Those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land. But those cursed by him, again, what is God's actions? We began by asking, watch for God's actions. Look, look at God's actions. God's actions, those are blessed by the Lord. God's actions. Here's the, God's actions again. But those cursed by him, so God is cursing some others. What is their end? They shall be cut off. Okay, so they're going to be cursed. They're going to be cut off. Um, verse 38, transgressors, I'm going to skip over that. You can look at that on your own. Go back and look at verse 12 through 15. Let's look at verse 12 through 15 here for a moment. The wicked plots against the righteous, gnashes his teeth at him. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. So here, the wicked, here's this image, right? The wicked are making this plan. They have this, they're, they, they, they're, have a plan that they're laying in place against the righteous. Uh, they, they're going to do wicked things against them. We have bad intentions. And the Lord laughs at the wicked. Verse 2, right? He's like the grass. God says, he, uh, the psalmist says he laughs because God knows that the day of the wicked is coming. It could be that, you know, this is referencing God's judgment, obviously, but he knows his day is coming. The wicked draw the sword. So here, here are their actions, right? Here's the actions of the wicked. They draw their sword. They bend their bows. Why? To bring down the poor and the needy, to slay those whose way is upright. Their sword, their own sword, watch this, shall enter their own heart and their bows shall be broken. You see, God laughs at the wicked. In the end, their own, their own plans, their own intentions will be their own destruction. So again, we, we see that this chapter focuses on the wicked quite a bit. Um, it also focuses on the righteous. Um, we're going to skip over this, but verse verse 9, those who wait for the Lord, you'll see this in verse 7. Uh, actually, let's real quickly look at verse 7, 9. Here we go. I'll try to be as brief as I can. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the one who carries out evil devices. Watch. Be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Verse 11, but the meek shall inherit the land, that's not the verse I wanted. Hang on a sec. Let me go back. I forgot what verse I wanted. Oh, verse 7, verse 9. Uh, verse 9. So for the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who, here's what I wanted. Wait for the Lord. Be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. And then I wanted to also look at verse 11. But the meek shall inherit the land. So how are the righteous described? Right? They're meek. They're the ones who are waiting before the Lord. What is, their, what is their reward? They shall inherit the land. So we again see the, the righteous, they're waiting for the Lord. They're patient, they're meek. They're going to, um, they're going to inherit the land. They're, can, they're called blameless. It says in verse 19, they're not going to be put to shame in evil times. It doesn't say God's going to protect them from evil times. But in those times, they're not going to be put to shame in them. Let me move myself a bit here. Verse 21. Look at, again at the righteous. We're not the righteous, again, as he describes them, the righteous are generous, they're generous, they give. Look at verse 17. We're, we're gonna look down at the bottom here. Notice verse 17. Here's kind of a key verse here as why we should not fret. Why should we not be worried about the wicked and evil, uh, evildoers? The arms of the wicked shall be broken. So here's their end, and again, here's the contrast. But the Lord, so the wicked is contrasted with the righteous. They're, they're, what's going to happen to them is contrasted. The arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. So while their arms are broken, who is it that is holding up the righteous? Whose arms are holding up the righteous? Their arms are broken. But the Lord holds up the righteous. Now look at that and look at verse 24 as well. Though he fall, and again, notice this. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be times the righteous go through difficulties. 
It doesn't mean that God is never going to let you have moments of distress. You're not going to ever be in the world. You're in the world. There's going to be hard times. And he says, though he fall, so there's going to be times where we have difficulties. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong. Why not? Again, because the Lord upholds his hand. So you need to look at there and, and note verse 17 and verse 24 together, right? The Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord upholds his hand. Why should I not fret? Because the wicked, because of the, why should I not be angry about the wickedness and the evil that's happening? Doesn't mean I should like it, but why should I not be obsessed and possessed? And, and why should I not let it over consume me? Because the Lord's going to deal with them. Because the Lord will bring them to his justice. Another couple of verses that I think are really great uh, 28, and then we'll skip down to verse 39 real quickly. Look at that. For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. Look at what, again, God's actions, right? He will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the children of the wicked shall be cut off. Again, note God's actions for the righteous and against the wicked. Skip down to the end of the chapter. The salvation of the righteous. Where, do, where does the salvation get their salvation? Where do they get their gain, if you will? It is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. And once again, I want you to see that it does not mean we will not have trouble. It does not mean we will not fall. In the, but, but here's the difference in the righteous is that the God, God will be there for us in these times. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them. Why, does, why is it that he helps them? Because they need help in times of difficulty. We need help in times of difficulty. And he delivers them. He delivers them. So notice this word just hopped you know, a couple of times here, right? He delivers them from who? From the wicked. He saves them. Why? Because they take refuge in him. You see, he is their stronghold. He is their mighty tower. He is that fortress that David would run to fortresses you know, in the Old Testament, he would find these places where he would hide from King Saul who sought to destroy him. God needs to be our stronghold. God needs to be the place we take refuge. We need to understand that God will, in his time, bring justice. So real quickly, as we, look, as we make a closing point here, why should we not fret because of evildoers? Because their end is coming. We saw this several times in the chapter. Why should we not fret because of evildoers? Because the Lord upholds the righteous. Verse 17, verse 24. Why should we not fret because of evildoers? Because the Lord is a deliverer to those who take refuge in him. There's a lot of things that are happening in our world, in our society, in our country right now that are discouraging, that are that cause me to fret, if I'm being honest. They, they do. I, I, get, I get caught up in it, and it, and it hurts, uh, and it bothers me. I need to stop like so many of you probably do too. I, we, I need to stop, you need to stop, we need to stop and be reminded that it is our God who is in charge. It is our God who upholds us. He upholds those who take refuge in Him. Let's be people then who trust in the Lord, who commit to the Lord, and He will deliver us. Thank you guys for your attention. You have a great day. God bless.